Hi, welcome back. This is grade three, weather and climate. Lesson 3.1, analyzing a year of data, part one. I'm scientist Kate. Remember me from chapter one? It's great to see you again. Welcome back to Seattle. For this lesson, you will need notebook page 39. So find this page. You'll also need something to write with, like a pen or a pencil. For this lesson, you will also need 20 small items. The activity calls them tokens, but you can use anything you have laying around your house. You could use beads, beans, paper clips, or even pieces of cereal. Anything small enough that you can fit 20 of them onto the page. That's all you need. Other than that, just be ready to be curious and do some awesome science. Okay, let's review what you learned in chapter two. This will be a great review for me as well. I called scientist Cynthia and she gave me these three big ideas from chapter two. The first one is that a month of data gives us better information to make a choice about the reserve. So remember in chapter one, we looked at one day of data and in chapter two, you looked at a whole month of data. Turns out a month of data gives us so much more to work with when we're making a choice for the orangutans. The second big idea is that data can be organized to help scientists make sense of it. And the third big idea is scientists' ideas can change when they learn new evidence. If we wanted to be really sure that Creek Island is the best island to locate the orangutan reserve, what questions would you want to ask? You can tell me any questions that you've been thinking of now. Yeah, those are great questions. So it turns out we've got some new information from the Wildlife Protection Organization. They've emailed us another month of data. The message says, we received another month of temperature data from Creek Island. We are attaching it so you can take a look and let us know whether this new information affects your argument. We want to choose the island that will continue to have the best weather for orangutan. Okay, cool. Let's look at this month of data and see if it's going to change our mind or help our argument. Okay, so looking at this data, the data on the top gives us the Creek Island uh, daily high temperatures in August, which you've already seen. So let's look at the temperature range for August. Do you remember how to find the range? Yeah, you start by finding the lowest number and then by finding the highest number. So the range shows us the entire span of temperatures that happened at Creek Island in August. So what is the, what is the range of temperatures for August? Yeah, it's 86 degrees Fahrenheit to 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Whew, that's pretty warm. Now let's look at the weather data for January. What is the range? Yeah, it's 46 degrees to 64 degrees. Now, it's kind of hard to visualize 46 degrees to 64 degrees, so let's use our visualization chart. Here are the temperature benchmarks. Can you find where 46 degrees would be on this chart? Point to the screen where you would put a little star for 46 degrees. Boop. Is that where you put your star in your mind? Great. Now, where do you think 64 degrees would be? Point to the screen and show me 64 degrees. Yeah, it's right below 70. Boop, there it is. So we know our range of temperatures for January fall in between refrigerator temperature and classroom temperature. Does that seem very warm? No, and we know orangutans need warm, hot, rainy climate in order to live. Hmm, that makes me wonder some questions about Creek Island. If these two months are so different, how can we be sure Creek Island has the best weather pattern for orangutans? What do you think? Yeah, I think we need more data. During chapter three, we're gonna be answering this question. Over many years, which island's weather will be best for orangutans? And today in this lesson, we're going to investigate this question. How can we predict what the weather in a place will be like many years from now? 
Now I want you to think about your ideas about your local weather, wherever you live. How does it change from month to month? What is it like during the different seasons? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Did you think about the different types of weather you experience over different seasons in where you live? Awesome. Here in Seattle, we have very dark, cool, rainy winters. It rains almost every day, but it never really snows. In the spring, we get kind of a mix. We have kind of cool springs, we have some sunny days, and we have some rainy days. In the summer, it's beautiful, sunny, warm. It doesn't really rain very much. And in the fall, we have cool, gray, rainy weather. So we have a lot of different types of weather in Seattle. Do you have a lot of different types of weather across the months where you live? I bet you do. So we've been using line plots. Do you remember that this is called a line plot? Line plots for one or two months are not enough. We need more data in order to find a long-term pattern. So let's look at some more temperature data for Creek Island. Ready? This is one year of line plot data for Creek Island. Does it make sense to you? Oh, it doesn't? Oh, your brain can't just take in all those numbers and make sense of them just like that? Yeah, it would be hard for anyone to do. It's hard to compare 12 different line plots at the same time. If we wanna actually find a pattern, we need a new way of looking at this data and organizing it. So today we're gonna to be using something called a bar graph. Say bar graph. Have you ever heard of a bar graph before? A bar graph is a tool that scientists use to organize data to compare or look for patterns over time. So today we're gonna to practice uh, making a bar graph and we're going to collect some data about durian fruits. Orangutans eat over 300 different types of food, including bark, leaves, and insects. But fruit is by far the most important part of their diet. Orangutans eat a lot of durian fruit. Look at that durian fruit in the picture. Looks kind of spiky. I've never seen a fruit like that before. Have you? For this data collection activity, you're going to need that notebook page 39 and you're gonna need those 20 little items that I told you to get at the beginning of the lesson. So if you don't have them, pause the lesson right here and go get them. And I'll meet you back here when you're ready to go. Okay, here's how this is gonna work. You're gonna listen as I read the story. You're gonna count the tokens on the tree at the end of each day and record the number in the data table. So basically, I'm gonna read the story Depending on what you hear happens in the story, you're going to change the number of ripe durians on the tree. So if durians ripen, you're going to add little pieces to your paper. And if durians fall down or they get eaten, you're going to remove durians from your paper. So then at the end of each day, you can see we're going to write down the total number of ripe durians on the tree. We're going to keep track over 10 days. So let's do the first one together. Okay, on the first day, a scientist counted nine ripe durian fruits on the tree. So in box number one, you're gonna put the number nine. All right, you ready for day two? On day two, the scientist noticed five more durians had ripened. So you're gonna add five of your little tokens to your paper. And then, Figure out if we started out on day one with nine durians, and on day two, there are five more durians, how many durians do we have on the tree now? Check your work. On day two, there should be 14 durians. So at this point, I want you to pause, make sure you're together with me, and on your tree, make sure that you have 14 different little pieces, whether you're using beads or beans or whatever you're using from around your house, make sure there's 14 of them on the tree. 
because from this point on, I'm just going to read all of the days and I'll pause at the end of each one for you to um, add or subtract durians from your tree. All right. Here's the rest of the story. On the third day, the orangutans ate four durians. On the fourth day, six durians ripened. On the fifth day, there was a storm. The wind knocked 11 durians off the tree. On the sixth day, orangutans ate two durians. On the seventh day, three durians ripened. On the eighth day, four more durians ripened. On the ninth day, one durian fell off the tree. And on the 10th day, orangutans ate five durians. Okay, if you need to hear that story again, you can always rewind the video back and pause after each one of those days so that you have plenty of time to add and remove tokens, as well as um, do the math so that you can go across the bottom of the worksheet. When you're ready and you have all of your answers for all 10 days, come back to the video and we'll check your work. All right, are you ready to check your work? We know that on day one, there were nine durians on the tree. And the next day, the scientists noticed five more durians had ripened. So since it says five more, we know we're adding. So nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So on day two, there were 14 durians. On day three, orangutans ate four durians. So we're going to take 14. We're going to subtract four, 13, 12, 11, 10. So on day three, there were 10 durians. On day four, six durians ripened. If it says ripened, we know we have to add on. So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. On day four, there were 16. On the fifth day, there was a storm and the wind knocked 11 durians off the tree. Wow, that's a lot. So we lost 11 of our 16 durians. Do you know how many durians were left on day five? Five durians were left. On day six, orangutans ate two durians. So we're going to take the five that we have, we're going to subtract two, and that gives us three durians. On day seven, three durians ripened. So we're going to take the three we have, we're going to add three more, one, two, three, four, five, six. On day eight, four more durians ripened. So ripened means we're adding on, so six, seven, eight, nine, ten. On day nine, one durian fell off the tree, so we're going to subtract one. That takes us to nine. And on day 10, orangutans ate five durians. So since uh, they ate the durians, we're going to subtract nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. How did you do? Great job. So we're going to pause the lesson right here. We'll pick back up next time with. Lesson 3.1, Analyzing a Year of Data, Part 1. 
or part two. And in part two, we will take our data we just collected about the durians and we will make a bar graph out of it. So I'm looking forward to seeing you for that. Hope you have a great day. See you next time. Hi, welcome back. This is grade three, weather and climate, lesson 3.1, analyzing a year of data, part two. I'm scientist Kate. For this part of the lesson, you won't need any extra materials, just a curious science brain. Are you ready? Great, let's go. Okay, remember in part one, we got all of a full year of data from Creek Island, but it was sent to us in line plots. And line plots are really hard to understand and make sense of when you have a lot of them. So we decided we were going to make a bar graph. Do you remember what a bar graph is for? Bar graphs are used to organize data to compare or look for patterns over time. Do you remember doing the activity where I read the story and you counted the number of ripe durians on a tree? Great, I hope you still have that from when we did the activity because you will need this to move forward and make the graph today. All right, we are going to use the data of about the ripe durians to create a graph. And I just wanna take a look at this graph really quick. Have you ever seen a graph like this before? Okay, across the bottom is called the x-axis. And the x-axis shows us the number of days. Day one, day two, day three, all the way up to day 10. This axis going up the side here is called the y-axis. And the y-axis has on it the number of durians. So we're gonna go across the x-axis to find the day, and then we're gonna go up to mark the number of durians. All right, so let's start with day one. Tell me how many durians I need to mark on the bar graph for day one. Yes, we need to mark nine durians. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the X axis across the bottom. We're gonna go to day one, and then we're gonna go all the way up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're gonna stop at the number of durians for that day. And then we're just gonna draw a little bar to represent how many durians are there. Boop, there it is. Do you see it? Does it make sense to you now why we call it a bar graph? Because we use bars that go up to mark a certain number. How far does the bar need to go up for day two? Look at the data. Yeah, it needs to go up to 14. So let's check it out. Boop, there it is. I marked on the bar graph. 14 durians on day two. How many durians should we see on the bar graph for day three? Yeah, we should see 10. Point to the screen to where the bar should stop for day three. Are you pointing? All right, let's check your work. Boop. There it is. Did you point to the right spot? Awesome. All right, let's look at day four. How many durians should the bar graph show for day four? Yeah, 16. So point to the screen to show me where the day four bar should stop. All right, ready to check your work? Here it is. Boop. Did you get it right? Awesome. All right, now let's do day five. How many durians do you, uh, should I mark for day five? Yeah, five. Five durians on day five, that's funny. All right, ready? Point to the screen to where, how high the bar should go. Ready? Boop. There it is, day five, five durians. What about day six? How many durians should we see? Yep, three durians. Here we go. Boop. There it is, day three. I'm sorry, not day three, day six, three durians. All right, day seven, how many durians should we see? Yeah, six. Point on the screen to where the bar should stop for day seven. Boop. There it is. All right, what about day eight? 10 durians, correct. Point two on the screen where it should stop. Boop. All right, awesome. What about day nine? 
Yeah, nine durians. Ready? Boop. There it is. All right, day 10, the last day, how many durians should I mark on the bar graph? That's right, four durians. Here we go. Awesome. Check this out. We took all of our data and we put it onto a bar graph so we can easily see all of our data and compare it. So which day had the most durians? Yeah, day four. You can easily see that because graphs are really good at helping you make sense of data. All right. What does the height of each bar tell us? You can tell me. The height of each bar tells us how many durians there were for a day. On which day did the big storm happen? Look at the data and see if you can tell when the big storm happened that knocked all the durians off the tree. Which day did you pick? Yeah, it looks like the big storm happened on day five because it went from way up high on day four to down low really quickly on day five. What happened after day six? Yeah, we can see a pattern in the data that after day six, the durian numbers went back up. Awesome. Bar graphs are super useful for keeping track of data over time. As we investigate island weather and think years into the future, we can look at bar graphs that show how temperature and precipitation change throughout the year. Now, for some more practice, let's look at some bar graphs from Shinangia Nature Reserve. Wow, okay, I'm gonna try that word again. Shinangia Nature Reserve, that's in China. Okay, so here's a bar graph from this nature reserve in China. Look across the x-axis on the bottom. Do you see that the months are listed? So we're seeing every single month. And what is this uh, bar graph showing us? Look up the y-axis. Yeah, it's showing us the rainfall in millimeters. So we're seeing a year's worth of rainfall broken down by month. What does this bar graph tell us about the rainfall? Yeah, it looks like there was a lot of rain in May, June, July, August, maybe not so much on the, in the other months. Now, let's look at this one. Again, across the bottom, do you see that it's showing us the months? And then what is it showing us on the y-axis that goes up and down? Temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Awesome. What does this graph show us about how temperature changes over the year? Look for a pattern and then tell me what you think. Did you happen to notice where the temperature looks like it's the highest? In like July, August, what season is that? Yeah, it's really, really hot there in the summer. What about the temperatures in January and February? Yeah, they're lower. So we know that it's hotter during the summer and cooler during the winter on this nature reserve. Now, the bar for May shows that the average high temperature was 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you see that on the graph over here? It's pointing to the month of May, and it's telling us that the bar goes up to the number 79 for 79 degrees. Do you think that it was 79 degrees every single day of May? Yes or no? Well, let's look at the temperature data for May. Here is the line plot for May. What is the range of temperatures for May's daily high? Do you remember how to find the range? You look for the lowest number up to the highest number. The lowest number is 67 and the highest number is 92. So the range is 67 to 92. Was it 79 degrees every single day? No, it was a lot of different temperatures every day. But do you see where 79 degrees is marked on the line? What do you think average high temperature means? If you had to guess, tell me. Yes, 
Yeah, so the average is kind of like a number that's in the middle. So there are going to be temperatures that are hotter than 79 that happened, and there's going to be temperatures that are lower than 79 that happened. But 79 degrees is a nice middle number that we could take to represent the whole month. Okay, let's look at December. What is the range for December? Tell me. Yeah, the lowest is 38 and the highest is 63. So the range is 38 degrees Fahrenheit to 63 degrees Fahrenheit. What do you think December's temperatures were like in general? Yeah, they were much cooler than the temperatures that we saw during the summer. The average temperature in December is near the middle. Some temperatures are below the average and some temperatures are above it. Does that make sense? It's kind of a nice middle number we can use to represent the whole month. The December bar has a label that says 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Even without that label, we could use the scale on the y-axis to find December's average temperature. So that means even if this number, this 51 degrees, wasn't already labeled for us, we could still figure it out. We would just take, we would just go to the top of the bar and we would follow it over. Boop, 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 to the side. And we can see that the number was in between 40 and 60. The number 50 is in between 40 and 60. So we would know that that bar is going to about 50 degrees. And it turns out that it's actually 51, which is pretty close. Average temperature for one month summarizes the data into one easy to use number. Why do you think meteorologists use averages when they make a bar graph? Tell me what you think. Yeah, it's much easier to take a general, um, like one number, rather than looking at every single tiny little piece of data. It's really hard for our brains to process that much information. So by taking one number to represent the whole month, we can easily compare all of the months. All right, that's it for lesson 3.1, Analyzing a Year of Data, part two. Great job. You did an awesome job helping me make a bar graph and I think we really learned some important information that's going to help us decide about the orangutan reserve ultimately. So I'll see you next time for lesson 3.2. I can't wait. Stay curious.